Welcome. Thank you very much. So I'd like to start with uh, a question. You have to guess, what do you see on this picture? Okay, you can take a guess. Anyone wants to venture something? There are cars, clearly it's a city. You don't see many people, but they're in the cars. You see many things, you see a quite uh, usual urban landscape. What you do not see here, though, uh, would be the Eiffel Tower. And the reason you don't see it is because of air pollution. And that curve behind me, back in March this year, was the uh, level of air pollution in Paris over the course of a few days. Specifically, the level of particulate matter, one of the uh, main air pollutants that come into your lungs uh, and causes health issues. Now, it's hard to get a, a sense of how high this is, but let me just show you what the average level of pollution in Beijing is. So quite bad, right? Now, what's really interesting about uh, air pollution is it changes much more than we usually think. Just like the weather changes uh, in a city, air pollution levels go up and down quite a bit. And on that specific occasion, because of what we call an inversion layer, meaning a moment when uh, hot air comes on top of cold air and really acts as a lid to concentrate pollution on the level, uh, at, at the ground level, pollution was extremely high in Paris. So when we saw this, my company Plume Labs that tracks pollution around the world, uh, we all based in Paris and we realized one morning uh, something's wrong. It's not possible to see Paris more polluted than uh, Beijing. So we uh, tweeted about it, uh, created quite a, a, a discussion and a debate around this. You might remember, for those of you who live in France, that around that time, they, uh, that actually sparked a debate on what the government uh, should do about air pollution because of these levels. And so what eventually happened, uh, March 20th was a Friday, if I'm right, when we saw this level go up above and beyond the uh, average pollution level in Beijing, was that the government decided to take half the cars from the road. It was decided right when pollution was falling down, the level was collapsing because that inversion layer was leaving. And it was enforced way after the peak. So what does this tell us? Well, first of all, that pollution is not only an issue uh, in cities where we imagine it as an issue, even uh, in Europe, even in France, uh, it can actually reach levels of course, it's not frequent, but that are very concerning for our health. Second, it tells us that it varies so much that it's hard to have appropriate responses. It's hard to know what to do. And the third thing is we really ought to find a better way to look at pollution than after the fact, analyzing data like this. Because it's not only uh, an issue for our cities, it's an issue for our health. And today, Pollution is actually the world's biggest pandemic. It has reached the scale of a global pandemic. Uh, just for context, the World Health Organization thinks that uh, and estimates that 7 million people die every year of indoor and outdoor pollution. That's actually more than smoking, which kills 6 million people per year. It's more than obesity that we speak so much of, we talk so much of. Uh, which I think represents 3 million avoidable deaths per year. And here in Toulouse, sorry to uh, break the news to s s some of, of us who live here, uh, but adults lose three months and a half of life expectancy just because of particulate matter. That's six months in Paris, and of course even more in some other capitals. Now, that's a pretty grim statistic. Uh, of course we know uh, that our environment is not in great shape. Now we know that our envi environmental health also suffers a lot from pollution. But our environment is not only an issue for our health, we see it as an information issue. And it may not sound like great news, but it actually is. Because if it's an information issue, because of how complex pollution is, because of how much it changes, hour by hour because of how complex and difficult it is 
to know what we can do to reduce our exposure to pollution, then it actually means that we can use the tools of information issues to solve it. And we know how to solve them. That's what people building digital technologies have been doing for years and years and years now. So that's what we do at uh, Plume Labs, the company I founded uh, last year with uh, my friend and co-founder, uh, David Lismir. We take the tools of the digital economy to empower citizens in cities around the world to understand what they breathe and know what they can do to act against it. So literally, we take environmental information and we try to bring it into everyone's hands. How do we do this? Of course, technology is involved, but people are involved, just like uh, Kent Larson just described. And the way we've thought of environmental monitoring today was very much to try to put a few very accurate, very expensive, very heavy sensors around cities. They're the one you saw on the, the previous slide. We're trying to have the exact opposite approach. What we need is for all of us to become sensors. Because if we know what we breathe, first of all, we'll be able to reduce our exposure to pollution. But the data we collect will also be useful to everyone else. And so we're disrupting pollution with what we call crowd sensing. That's crowdsourcing with sensors. So we help understand what each of us individually is exposed to thanks to uh, a data cloud that tracks pollution around the world, a mobile app that makes it easy and uh, immediate for everyone to understand, and hardware that will help us sense our own exposure and then share it with others. So the cloud, uh, we actually released a map of the world to realize it and to visualize it uh, during COP21. Uh, that worked really well. We got uh, a lot of attention around the world. It helps you track how pollution changes in real time in all these cities where we track this, this number and where open data is available. So that's a really big, big one. In order to make uh, this information accessible, we need access to data. And so open data is, is the key here. So we work with the cities, the government around the world to have access to live pollutant uh, data. On top of this, first of all, we build a mobile app to make it uh, accessible to everyone. It's on iPhone, Android, it's free. But more importantly, it's not just about what you breathe, it's about what you can do about it. And so we've built uh, AI models using machine learning technologies, predictive technologies, that is based on this uh, data you can track here. That's, what, that's the little curve you see. And all the dotted lines here are models that we train in order to be able to predict how pollution will change. Because if you know that pollution is going to be higher, in the morning, then you better go for your jog or biking or get your kids out uh, earlier than the pollution peak. And bear in mind that because pollution changes day in, day out, hour by hour, this means you can actually get some sense of control on your environment and reduce its impact on your health. Now to go beyond this, uh, we also need to have hardware. We need to have personal sensors uh, to help us track not only what our cities uh, and what, what pollution is in our cities is, but uh, what's the room in which we are, what the transportation mode in which we are impacts our environmental exposure. And for a year and a half now, we've been working with uh, CNRS uh, researchers here in France to build personal, mobile, um, low cost and low consumption sensors of air pollution. Uh, we did a first deployment back in June at this festival called Futur en Seine. And for the first time, we brought together uh, about 100 visitors to the festival who took a sensor prototype with them, connected it to their phone, and in real time, as they were walking around the grounds of the exhibition, were able to track their own exposure and also build a live map of air pollution in that neighborhood of Paris. And so that's our vision very much for uh, how we are going to solve, if not pollution, at least the impact of pollution in our health, it's by giving individuals the levers, the tools to act against uh, their exposure, to understand it, to know what they can do, and by crowd sensing air pollution, we'll be able to make it a much more central feature of the way we think of our cities and the way we govern them. And just think of all these sectors. If we make the air more transparent in cities, we'll be able to improve healthcare for people who suffer from um, respiratory conditions, from asthma. That's 10 to 15% of the population, it's huge numbers. Uh, we'll be able to improve our energy infrastructure by making it more attuned to the impact it can have on uh, cities. 
our transportation uh, infrastructure will be able to take this into account. Uh, consumer products, the media will be able to report on it, will be able to take it into account in their decisions they help uh, citizens and consumers form. So if we make the air more transparent, we will be able to make our cities breathable again. So thank you very much. And uh, I'll be more than happy to answer questions after this. Thank you.